I'm Dr. Adam Jirachi. And this is Love's a Secret Weapon podcast. And before you heard us, that was Donna performing her song, Love's a Secret Weapon, in 1964's beach party hit, Bikini Beach. During that revolutionary decade, Donna was everywhere. After starting off as a child performer in the late 1950s in Mar Vista, a seaside suburb of Los Angeles, including in a small part in Playhouse 90 starring Robert Redford, Donna was chosen to represent Dr. Pepper as their one and only Dr. Pepper girl for five years. This changed her and her family's life and led to a plum part in the Beach Party films, including the fan favourite Beach Blanket Bingo, where Donna performed her signature tune, It Only Hurts When I Cry. Donna was the featured vocalist on pioneering rock and roll TV show Shindig, recorded with the Wrecking Crew and LA's top producers at Crest, Challenge, Capital and Reprise Records, and found time in a very busy schedule to appear on the TV series Dr. Kildare, The Monkeys, and Batman. Did I mention she made her own clothes for her performances? Simplicity Pattern Company noticed that and signed her up as a spokesperson for them too. But this is only part of her story. In this podcast, Donna and I will talk about her work, life experiences, and what it means to her to represent the swinging 60s. At the end of that decade, and as the ambivalent 1970s kicked in, Donna retired at 21 to raise a family. Her story doesn't end there, though, as she dug deep to understand her early life experiences, including the shadow of a family secret, and tried to assimilate what she had seen as a teenager, such as performing in Dallas just a few hours after President Kennedy's assassination, touring with Dick Clark and the Supremes in the segregated South, and being part of a generation that sowed the seeds for change in the United States and the world. So Donna, we've known each other for quite a long time now. Oh, Adam, (laughs) our friendship has really matured into a beautiful romance. I mean, (laughs) doing this podcast with you, this first episode, I have butterflies like we're on a first date. <laughs> <laughs> now, as we know, both, both of so sweet. <laughs> both of us have. It's been a while since a, a first a first date for either one of us, but I do like that feeling of a first date. <laughs> uh, so, for for our listeners, um, it was quite interesting. Uh, oh, probably almost twenty years ago now, mm. uh, right around the the turning of the millennium. Mm-hmm that uh, you and I connected, uh, you were doing uh, a paper for, for one of your projects at school and at uni. Mm-hmm. And uh, you wanted to incorporate me into, into it. And uh, so at the time I was living in Hawaii uh, on, uh, on Oahu in Honolulu. And uh, we, we, we struck up a a Skyping kind of relationship so we could meet each other long distance. That's right. And, and yeah, (laughs) and, uh, and it's just bloomed and blossomed ever since. And, um, and then of course, uh, what kind of spawned this podcast was the five years that we spoke and um, created a manuscript about uh, my autobiography Mm. and, I wanted to collaborate with you, Adam, because of your PhD in psychology, so that whatever stories that I recalled, you know, made sense (laughs) to myself (laughs) as well, as well as anybody who would ever read it or, but, you know, it's kind of innovative uh, that you and I are deciding to kind of bypass the um, traditional way and and tell my story mm. um, through a podcast. It's it's very very intriguing. I'm excited about it because I think, as as you said, you know, we started off with a manuscript, and we do have, you know, quite a lengthy, um, you know, manuscript, including when I came over to LA in ooh, I think it was probably 2011, and we spent a week in your in your little uh, house in I think it was Beverly <laughs> Glen. 
<laughs> yes, with, yes, my little English cottage. We've painted, <laughs> I can't remember, were they orange walls? I'm trying to remember now, but, um, and, and we. Oh, right, right. Remember that? Yeah, and we sat, and we sat there, you know, probably at your kitchen table and, and we wrote together. And then, you know, before that and after that, we, we continued on Skype in sort of your late afternoon and, and my early mornings, um, you know, here in Australia. Uh, and, you know, and, and here we are, you know, wanting to sort of reach out, I guess, during this time, which is, um, you know, really challenging to say the least for a lot of people. Yes. Yes. And it's, I'm glad you mentioned that you're in Australia, you're mm. in Adelaide and, and I moved from Hawaii a decade ago to West Los Angeles, but currently I'm living in the mountains above Palm Springs. So, uh, good, you know, good idea to give that kind of geography mm. to to our listeners as well that um there there is no distance between us absolutely i agree and and yeah i mean the technology helps but you know we've we've known each other such a long time and i think we know each other so so well so i'm really excited to sort of you know just sit here and, and talk to you and and you know everyone listening um out there uh so how how exciting for our first, um, I guess, episode. So I thought today, well, we spoke about what we were going to um, talk a little bit about, but today, can I take you a little bit back to Batman? Oh, that, that sounds great. <laughs> so we know that in, you know, 1966, there was a new hit on the ABC network, and that was Adam West as the Cape Crusader and Burt Ward as the Boy Wonder. And Donna, you won a plum role uh, in a two-part episode, um, the role of Susie, a head cheerleader at Woodrow Roosevelt High, um, recruited by the Joker, who was played by the wonderful Cesar Romero. Um, and you were recruited uh, to assist in his various schemes with sort of the younger high school set. That's right. Yeah, I, well, I was, I was the bad girl um, <laughs> turned good you know i i'm so glad that i had a conscience you know? <laughs> <laughs> well we always do at the end so, of batman don't we Mo most people find their way um and and susie definitely did but but that was a that was a a, a very um kind of uh, interesting segue i i had just completed my year and a half of doing live rock and roll shows on television and um that was the show called Shindig, mm. which is, you know, you can see it. You can see a lot of those shows on YouTube mm. now, but it was, it was quite um, the innovative show because everything was live and it was the beginning of the British invasion. So we had everyone, mm. the Beatles and the Stones and all, you know, Motown people and Aretha Franklin and I, I just, just so many, many people on Shindig. And then there was some controversy because of the racial um, issue for, oh, I guess, not mid mid sixties uh, America, that's right. And uh, and the show was just suddenly taken off the air and replaced by Batman, mm, mm. which <laughs> which I auditioned for and um, and was on. I believe it was the fourth show that was uh, that was filmed, and um, and so it was kind of new in the process of you know, becoming the sensation that it, that it became. So I just recall, you know, uh, uh, being, oh, I think 18 years old mm. and, you know, needing a, a guardian. And my, my adopted father was my, uh, my manager as well. And so, so we drive up to um, the studio in Culver city which is like the old Selznick studios where it looks like gone with the wind, mm. you know, with the, the pillars and, you know, the, the mansion of Tara <laughs> and, and uh, drive up to the security gate. And there are already fans that are climbing on the chain link. They already to try to get over. They already knew about yes. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, you know, Adam West became a hero and, uh, and did so for many, many, many decades. I, I think he's probably, maybe he's probably the most well-known and most beloved of all the Batmans. So, but it, it was quite, quite an experience um, being on the set, especially with, uh, with Cesar Romero, yeah. who uh, 
showed up in full costume. I never saw him out of costume. And, and literally he shows up on set, starts laughing like the Joker and that's, that's <laughs> scared the sight. bejesus out that's of me. That's an absolute <laughs> sight. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, he, you know, he was such an elegant man for him to take that That's role. Right. It was pretty, pretty uh, amazing. And, and then, you know, we had these scenes together and, um, and I discovered we had something in common because he was, he had a, a little oxygen tank that he would carry with himself everywhere. And I'm in, uh, have had asthma since I was a little yeah. girl and, and he was having breathing difficulties. And so, you know, I mean, it's not the best thing to have in common, but, you know, it was something we, we shared it's a bond. together. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Inhale, exhale. <laughs> Inhale, exhale. And, and, uh, and so he was, he, that was, that was kind of the highlight of my experience in Batman. And, um, and that takes me to many years later mm. when I was invited to go to, a convention for Batman um, in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, Bert, Bert Ward was there and, um, and Julie Newmar who played Catwoman was there and Adam West was there and um, a few other people that had played characters. um, Mm. And I was invited. So it, it, it was um, a surprise to me because uh, when you, you know, when you're at these nostalgic uh, affairs, mm. the the people that show up, they're looking everywhere to get autographs and meet the celebrities and, you know, and they're circulating. Yeah. But this one man, this kind of kind of big guy mm. with a with a with an accent that sounded like um, uh, an East Coast New Jersey accent. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, came up to, <laughs> <laughs> he came up to my table and um, and he didn't leave. <laughs> and, and he stayed, he kind of like stood mm. around for a while and, and you know, and, and just hung out a little bit and, and other people would come by and he'd step aside and, and, and then he'd come right back and, and just, and then he started telling me that he made a special trip out to see me that fantastic and yeah and um and that he had a wife mm. and two kids and a house in new jersey oh there you go new jersey <laughs> <laughs> i like how that just clicked hey. just then. that's great <laughs> yeah. i mean it must be one of these you know cop tv shows that i hear <laughs> new jersey and i was like okay that sounds like he kind of fit that 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 uh, mold yes yeah. <laughs> yes and um, and then he told me his name and and I said, well, you know, here's a chair. Why don't you sit down? And he's like, mm. I came here to see you. OK. And he stayed by by my table for the several hours mm. that I was there. Mm. And by then um, we exchanged information. He said, well, if you're ever in on the East Coast, if you're ever in New York, New Jersey, I'm your guy. I will pick you up at the airport. I will, you know, take you wherever you need to go. And um, and that and we struck mm-hmm. up a friendship. Mm-hmm. And and also, of course, my husband, Jared, was there and um, who, by the way, was my prom date. So we've known each other forever. Yes, that's a, that's and... <laughs> a story we have to cover sometime because it's a great one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And, um, and so the three of us became friends Mm. and, um, and I, I, I contacted him and, uh, we started chatting Mm. on a regular basis because he shared with me that, um, he was a police, he had been a police officer, but he was no longer, uh, you know, in that position. And the reason I, I'm bringing this up Mm. uh, and kind of tying it into Batman is because of the police brutality that has been occurring in the United States and, and um, you know, the, the murders that have occurred lately and, and the black lives matter movement that have really gone global and um, justly so Mm. well, this man began asking me to have fairly lengthy conversations and I decided to go for it 
So I contacted him and um, we began uh, kind of a lengthy uh, relationship of when he was a police officer, um, he came from a family that um, his father was a career policeman mm. and um, and that, you know, he just wanted to follow in his father's tradition. And um, for 13 years, he, he did so. Um, mm. But he never liked using a gun. He liked knowing the names of the prostitutes. Yeah. <laughs> he, he didn't, he didn't want to harm them. Yeah. He, he, he made friends with the drug dealers mm. and, um, you know, he, he, his heart was really not into, um, being dominant or the authority over them. He wanted to make friends with them and see, you know, if, if if their lives were in trouble and, you know, yeah. how could, how could he direct their lives? And, um, and of course he was working within a system that, you know, gave him so much pressure mm. that he wasn't following the decorum of what he should be doing. And so after 13 years, he, he put it all away and wow. but it, it, it caused him a lot of, of grief yeah. and it, it took him actually, Oh, oh, about three years to recover. Wow. Um, and in the meantime, he met a lovely lady and um, she became his his shoulder, you know, yeah. to uh, yeah. to basically, you know, <laughs> bear his soul. And um, and they they got married. And eventually, uh, when I did go to the East Coast uh, for, uh, you know, for other reasons, he did pick me up and he did introduce me to his family. And we all went out to their fav favorite pizza parlor together. <laughs> and uh, so I got to know her a yeah. little bit. Yeah. And in the meantime, uh, he and I kept up our relationship. And he told me, you know, my wife is so talented and, you know, and I'm making a, a, a decent living you know, we have a nice home in the, yeah. in the country and, and my children are healthy and, and happy. And, um, but you know, we're, we're kind of struggling and, and my wife is a stay at home mom. Mm -hmm. So that led to a conversation with his wife and, you know, I'm not a therapist. <laughs> you know? I, I don't have any formal background like you, you know, yeah. in psychology but my heart was going out yeah, to them and they were responding. And so she talked to me and told me that she was very good at computer mm. work and she gave me a little bit about, about her background that her family actually came in on the Mayflower. Oh my God. They go way back. Don't they? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, she was steeped in American yeah. history and, um, and she basically lived um, accordingly. I mean, she kind of kept up the tradition of her family mm. and, and lived a very, very quiet life. Well, I, I said, you know, you have this computer skill and your children are going to school. What are you doing all day? Yeah. yeah. And so later when I, you know, talked to her husband again, he said, you know, my wife is now we're getting a part-time job and, you know, and we're making ends meet and she seems to be happy about it. And I'm happy, uh, you know, he, he loved, uh, his first love was um, uh, skin diving. Right. And so he learned how to mix oxygen tanks and got a job at a at a dive i think he called it a dive shop <laughs> and which is you know it's the oxygen yeah. has to be mixed correctly yeah, you absolutely. know for these dives and then he then he started getting asked to um go on these expeditions mm. for sunken ships to explore you know what was left at the bottom of wow. the sea had or he, whatever had he ever done anything like this before no so he just picked no it up. i mean yeah 
he loved swimming and, you know, um, living where he was, he was near lakes and mm. the ocean. And so he was, he loved, he loved the water, but he kind of grew into the, into his passion mm. when he finally gave up his identity in following his father's footsteps. And that must've been pretty hard because I mean, like you said, it was steeped in his family that his his father was a cop, and and I know you know sort of reading a lot of sort of because there's a there's a fair bit of psychological literature out there on police and the whole idea that it's often seen so much as as your identity. So it's not just the job you do, um, but it's your actual identity. So that must have been a big, um, you know, I guess psychological sort of sort of shift for him. Do you do you have any sort of idea um, what his kind of I guess, process was like, I presume it took quite a, a long time from the time he, he made the decision or perhaps he'd started thinking about, you know, leaving the police until he did. How long it sort of took him to sort of find this new passion and interest? Yeah, I think it was the, the three years that wow. he was recovering yeah. from making the initial decision, getting into a relationship with this lady, getting married, and then deciding, you know, how they were going to start their lives. Right. So he did. That's interesting that she didn't know him when he was actual cop. She met him when he was sort of processing all these experiences. Yes. Yeah. Yes. When he was in depression yeah. and, you know, when he knew that, you know, he just his um, disposition, uh, you know, his um, empathy for mm. people, um, you know, just didn't take him in the direction of being an authority yeah. And, you know, and being anywhere, you know, violent or, you know, violence was just you know, all he wanted to do was dive in the ocean mm. and watch, you know, um, the uh, the sea creatures and and uh, and see what did he say? Oh, what are those? I forgot what they're called now. But anyway, they're they um, light up in the ocean, he said. You know, you get to a certain depth and mm. it's very dark down mm. there. And all of a sudden you, you see lights like stars in the sky. I tell you, I wish I knew uh, I'm terrible at sort of marine life. or gen uh, if, if my partner Bob was here, he'd be able to tell you straight away exactly what they, <laughs> what they were. So we might need to ask him. <laughs> but, well, you know, maybe one of our listeners can yeah, also chime in but and how, you know, let us. How beautiful. Yeah. I remember years ago, you told me, this is a bit of an aside, but you told me to read Rachel Carson's sea, The Sea Around Us and just her beautiful yes. description of, of sort of the, you know, the life under the water. It's just a you know, fabulous book. Yes. So romantic. And, you know, coming from a scientist, you know, she was, yeah, she she was, was. one of the mm. first female scientists in America and and but her writing was poetic yeah. and yeah. when she talks about the sea you know it's it's pure poetry it is absolutely so, <laughs> sorry for that little sidetrack yes down down the down well the and it's interesting that you say that mm. because this fellow mm. uh had read that book as well right there you go i think it, it's it's probably a pretty inspiring one for you know a lot of a lot of people I do recommend it. You know, Rachel Carson was the lady that wrote Silent Spring. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, when she wrote about DDT and, um, you know, the ground being poisoned yeah, by fertilizers yeah. and and coming up under groundwater and contaminating the earth. And, you know, she was one of the very first people, environmentalists, she was, that yeah. brought that to our attention. But before that, I would I would say at least a decade before that, she was exploring the sea, yeah, yeah, and wrote her beautiful "The Sea Around Us." So yes, I'd recommend you know anyone that loves nature that uh, this book would feed their soul. Yeah, for sure, absolutely, absolutely. So so ultimately, you know, it, this this whole um, George Floyd, mm. you know, murder that occurred that really just burst open the hearts of so many people all over the globe. Yeah. Um, you know, brought back this idea of someone that that has a conscience and I know many, 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 probably, you know, the majority of all law enforcement officers, you know, have compassion, yeah, yeah. but the, 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 um, the people that, 
that are not well suited for that position, you know, like my friend, mm. um, and he went in a different direction, um, or that, you know, they take it so seriously that they're no, they're, they're no hero like Batman. Yeah. They're not trying to save yeah. the day. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a very, um, shall we say, um, egocentric mm. situation that, that gets out of control and, and, and we can, and we, yeah, we, I, I was looking, I was just going to say, I was looking into this sort of the other day um, because there's a whole lot of sort of emerging kind of literature coming out and looking at, well, you know, what are the, the stresses that police face? Because I think what we've seen, you know, as you said, that with the George, George Floyd, um, murder um you know we're seeing this idea of police brutality and so on and and i think you know we want to make it clear that we think you know the the grand majority of of police are you know are are, are really fantastic but we know that they do you know there's there's a whole range of sort of these stresses that often lead people such as your friend to leave the force because um, you know, there's the stresses of, uh, you know, the danger of being tasked with protecting others, carrying a gun, which I know you said he, he didn't like to do, um, you know, negative mm-hmm. experiences within the organisation, negative experiences sort of in dealing with some of the public, you know, the need that they need to often mask emotions and, and things like that. And, and that's quite similar to a lot of the other people that I, I speak to. You know, I, I do work with health professionals and so on, many of those issues, but then there's also that level of, of the danger and and you know we know this can play out in people getting depressed or anxious or or you know in the police case that decreased feeling that they're accomplishing something or just becoming exhausted you know um by the whole thing so you know i think it's it's really interesting for him um you know there w- there was a lot of a lot of those issues and certainly we know that um you know other police talk about that often the reason they become disillusioned or leave is you know the lack of support within the organization the demands the job pressure the all that kind of stuff, plus, you know, the kind of working hours they, they do. So, you know, it, it, it is a really difficult, I think it's, I think it's class is, I think the third most stressful occupation. I'm not sure what the other two are, but um, yeah, just a lot to deal with and probably a lot for him to process sort of coming out of it. Could be close to military. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And, and possibly, you know, uh, in the healthcare systems, you know, where you're on call mm. and, and, uh, and you're overworked and really you're a public servant, basically. Yeah. Uh, m- maybe not a surgeon, but, but, but you are a servant to the, mm. to the, the mm. public. And, um, and it, if you're overworked and, you know, you, you're, you're in an operating room, you know, <laughs> you want to be at, at, at your best. Yeah. And, yeah. And if and if you're if you're in military, you want to make the best decisions, mm. which, you know, and 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 then when you're on the police force trying to enforce the law. Yeah. And that's another issue, you know, I mean, but getting down to it, mm. I, I, I'm I'm just a simple, you know, pedestrian um, who who's looking at all of this yeah. that's going on all yeah. over the, the planet and seeing that there is transformation mm, occurring mm. and um you know and and that there you know the people that i'm inspired by are people like this man and his wife that did you know they they pivoted mm. into into positions of fulfillment and service and um, and the ability to provide for themselves in a way that was rewarding and that, you know, kept their family quite happy and unified. Mm. Um, and um, and it's very brave, you know, to to take take those change, you know, that that it pivot and make yeah. those changes in your life Um when you, you know, I uh, personally made the same decision, which we can get mm. into it in the future. Mm. Um, and, you know, and you pro- probably relate to that as well, Adam. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just when you were saying that and thinking about your friend as well, that whole idea of, of when you decide you, you want to live your life in line with whatever your, you know, your values are. And, and often that's hard to, you know, figure out what they are because, you know, we go from, you know, I don't know, you go to school and, and you, you start a job or you start, or in your case, you started so young, you know, performing and, and, and so on, you know, so young that, you know, often it's that time to figure out what, you know, what are my values? What do I want to do? And, and what do I think I can, 
um, you know, what I want to achieve. And, and for him to sort of say, hey, this, ain't, this isn't working for me and to completely do this, this complete, you know, 360, um, you know, I think it's really just inspiring. And, you know, and when you think about matters of the heart, mm. you know, it's kind of like your heart connected with mine mm. and his heart told him to come to L.A. and connect with yeah. me. Yeah. My heart told me to open up to him. And, you know, and even though I'm not, you know, an accredited person in that regard, my heart guided me. And, um, and if you want to go further, you know, we can say, you know, spirit guided all of us mm. into this place that we're at. And um, that, you know, hopefully is the direction that this uh, planet is going in with all humanity, because I think it's the dehumanization uh, that is, has just yeah. reached, you know, yeah. a peak of, of intolerance and, you know, Yes, it's really fun to think about Batman mm. in the '60s, mm -hmm. and you know the fun that 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 portrayed. Um, but literally, you know, uh, the changes that are occurring these days. I'd love to continue our conversation mm -hmm. about what happened, you know, in the incredible uh, time of the '60s, yeah. where so many of these seeds were planted. And they've been gestate, you know, gestating, um, and and now here we mm. are, um, fifty years later, sixty years later. And, <laughs> and, wait a minute! Holy, wait, holy wait, cow! Yeah. <laughs> holy cow! Batman. When did that? When did that <laughs> happen? Yeah, uh, you know, half half a, a yeah. century later, at least, and um, and we we are at we are at a very. Um, dangerous time mm -hmm. in all of our lives yeah. and you know for human for the survival of humanity and so you know love's a secret weapon mm -hmm. uh came as a as a, a tool for you and i to show our love toward each other and tell stories of love yeah and um and continue continue on with this journey and be part of the ethers of this beautiful podcast world. I know it's 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 exciting, and and you know, like we said, you know, at the time now, I think it's it's so important. And a lot of people in the work I do, I I do a lot of work, as you know, on on you know empathy. And I, I think you know, you just talking about you and your friend, just that's that's just empathy in action. But you know, at the moment, it's so important to just be compassionate to ourselves and to you know other people. And and I think we we're kind of hoping that you know. Through some of your stories you know the the cool stories of the 60s and all that work you did but more 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 than that to actually to look at you know what sort of was occurring at that time and and where we are now and and um you know where can we go from there in during all this change and and everything that's going on um you know politically health wise um with what we're experiencing around the world and, and all those sorts of things so onward and upward <laughs> and i uh i look forward to reconvening and uh continuing our beautiful secret of sharing love together fantastic it's been great to speak um with you and, and touch base here and and i hope anyone that's listening you know has enjoyed and, and we look forward to sharing with you in the future thank you adam thanks a lot bye bye everybody <laughs> Thanks for listening to Love's a Secret Weapon podcast. Please join us next time for another episode as we blaze a trail presenting to you a multi-sensory audio autobiography through storytelling. <laughs>